Hey folks, I'm back. Uh, I've got my tea, little chai tea, warm, can't go wrong. We've only got a few pages of this chapter left. Um, Dorian Gray is walking down the hallway and um, thinking about what his ancestors have bequeathed to him. Um, it's a very interesting situation that's sort of been led up to uh, throughout the rest of the chapter. Uh, he's he's looking at his ancestry and what he's he's gained from his ancestors. And, um, you know, there's an element of Darwinism there. It talked about how he was interested in Darwinism for a year and learned everything there was to learn about it. Uh, but there's also an element of Catholicism here because he's not interested in, you know, physical traits that he received from his ancestors. He's interested in the sins and... Um, the sorts of things that, that he's been bequeathed through their blood, sort of the passions and the emotions, which is a weird marriage of that Catholic idea of original sin and the way that it affects us, and Darwinism and the idea that your ancestors provide the genetic code by which um, you are formed. And so, you know, Oscar Wilde's playing with these two ideas and merging them together as Dorian Gray tries to find an excuse for the reason he is the way he is by looking at his ancestors and who they were he's always trying to find excuses for himself and and give himself an out for his his choices and his behaviors and this is no exception to that all right where was i um here was Philip Herbert, described by Francis Osborne in his Memoirs of the Regions of Queen Elizabeth and King James as, quote, one who was caressed by the court for his handsome face, which kept him not long company. Was it young Herbert's life that he sometimes led? Had some strange poisonous germ crept from body to body till it had reached his own? Was it some dim sense of that ruined grace that had made him so suddenly and almost without cause give utterance in Basil Hallward's studio to the mad prayers that so changed his life? Here, in gold-embroidered red doublet, jeweled surcoat, and gilt-edged ruff and wristbands, stood Sir Anthony, Anthony Sherrard with his silver and black armor piled at his feet. What had this man's legacy been? Had the lover of Giovanna of Naples bequeathed him some inheritance of sin and shame? Were his own actions merely the dreams that the dead man had dared not realize? Here, from the fading canvas, smiled Lady Elizabeth Devereux. In her gauze hood, pearl stomacher, and pink slash sleeves, a flower was in her right hand, and her left clasped an enameled collar of white and damask roses. On the table by her side lay a mandolin and an apple. An apple. Um, there were large green rosettes upon her little pointed shoes. He knew her life and the strange stories that were told about her lovers. He had, had he something of her temperament in him? These oval, heavy-lidded eyes seemed to look curiously at him. What of George Willoughby, with his powdered hair and fantastic patches? How evil he looked. The face was saturnine and swarthy, and the sensual lips seemed to be twisted with disdain. Delicate lace ruffles fell over the lean yellow hands that were so overladen with rings. He had been a macaroni of the 18th century, and the friend of his youth in his youth of Lord Ferris. What of the second Lord Beckham? the companion of a prince regent in his wildest days, and one of the witnesses at the secret marriage with Miss Fitzherbert. How proud and handsome he was with his chestnut curls and insolent pose. What passions had he bequeathed? The world had looked upon him as infamous. He had led the orgies at Carlton House. The star of the garter glittered upon his breast. Beside him hung the portrait of his wife, a pallid, thin-lipped woman in black. Her blood also stirred within him. How curious it all seemed. And his mother, with her Lady Hamilton face and her moist, wine-dashed lips, he knew what he had gotten from her. He had gotten from her his beauty and his passion for the beauty of others. She laughed at him in her loose, bacchantine dress. There were vine leaves in her hair. Purple spilled from the cup she was holding. The carnations of the painting had withered, but the eyes were still wonderful in their depth and brilliancy of color. They seemed to follow him wherever he went. Yet... One had ancestors in literature as well as in one's own race, nearer perhaps in type and temperament, many of them, and certainly with an influence of which was more absolute one of which one was more absolutely conscious. There were times when it appeared to Dorian Gray that the whole of history was merely the record of his own life, not as he had lived it in act and circumstance, but his imagination has created it for him, and as it had been his brain and his pet as if it had been his brain and his passions. He felt that he had known them all, these strange, terrible figures that had passed across the stage of the world and made sin so marvelous and evil so full of subtlety. 
It seemed to him that in some mysterious way, their lives had been his own. The hero of the wonderful novel that had so influenced his life, ah, we're back to the book, um, had himself known this curious fancy. In the seventh chapter, he tells how, crowned with laurel, lest lightning might strike him, he had sat at T Tiberius in a garden at Capri, reading this shameful book of Elphantis, while dwarves and peacocks strutted round him, and a flute player mocked the swinger of the censer. And as Caligula had caroused with the green-shirted jockeys at their tables, and supported an ivory manger with a jewel-fronted horse, and as Domitan had wandered through a corridor lined with marble mirrors, looking round with haggard eyes for the reflection of the dagger that was to end his days, and sick with ennui, that terrible disease that comes on those whom life denies no to whom life denies nothing, and had peered through a clear emerald at the red shambles of the circus, then in a litter of pearl and purple drawn by silver-shod mules, had been carried through the streets of pomegranates to a house of gold, and heard men cry, on Nero Caesar as he passed by, and as Elagabus had painted his face with colors and piled, plied the distaff among the women and brought the moon from Carthage and given her in mystic marriage to the sun. Over and over again, Dorian used to read this fantastic chapter and the two chapters immediately following, in which, in some in which, as in some curious tapestries or cunningly wrought enamels, were pictured the awful and beautiful forms of those whom vice and blood and weariness had made monstrous or mad. Filippo, Duke of Milan, who slew his wife and painted her lips with scarlet poison that her lover might suck death from the dead thing he fondled. Pietro Barbi, the Venetian known as Paul II, who sought in his vanity to assume the title of Formosus, and whose tiara, valued at 200,000 florins, was, brought, was bought at the price of a terrible sin. Gian Maria Visconti, who used hounds to chase living men, and whose murdered body was covered with roses by a harlot who had loved him. The Borgia on his white horse, with fratricide riding beside him, and his mantle stained with the blood of Parado, Pietro Renario, the young Cardinal Archbishop of Florence, child and minion of Sixtus IV, whose beauty was equaled only by his debauchery, and who received Leonora of Aragon in a pavilion of white and crimson silk, filled with nymphs and centaurs and gilded boy that he might serve at the feast as Ganymede or Hylas. Ezelin, whose melancholy could be cured only by the spectacle of death, and who had a passion for red blood, as other men have for red wine, the son of the fiend, as was reported, and one who had cheated his father at dice, then gambling with him for his own when gambling with him for his own soul. Giam Basadia Sibo, who in mockery took the name of Innocent, and into whose torpid veins the blood of three lads was infused by a Jewish doctor. Siscimondo Maltesia, the lover of Isoda and lord of Rimini, whose effigy was burned at Rome as the enemy of God and man, who strangled Polynesia with a napkin and gave poison to Ginerva d'Este in a cup of emerald, and in honor of a shameful passion built a pagan church for Christian worship. Charles IV, no, Charles VI, who had so wildly adored his brother's wife, that a leper had warned him of the insanity that was coming for him, and who, when his brain had thickened and grown strange, could only be soothed by Saracen cards painted with the image of love and death and madness. And in his trim jerkin and jeweled cap and acanthus-like curls, um, Griffinetto Baglioni, who slew a store with his bride and Sormento with his page, and whose comeliness was such that, as he lay dying in the yellow piazza of... Perugia, those who had hunt hated him could not.